Hi, and thank you to everyone for participating in the webcast. My name is Kristen Cuddington. I'm a member of the board of Women in Mining Canada, and I will be hosting this webcast on behalf of WIM Canada. Please note that this webcast will be recorded and made available online. Link will be posted on the WIM Canada website. It's our pleasure to be able to provide this opportunity to Patricia Tershman and Heather Bruce Vitch. These are two truly remarkable women who will be telling us about their trailblazing journeys. Some background, the WIM Canada Trailblazer Award recognizes women who have contributed extensively to the development of the mineral industry in Canada recognizes women who have mentored women along their journey, either in school or in their careers, who have played a pivotal role in highlighting the role of women in the industry. Patty served for three years as Vice President Exploration for North American Nickel, where she led the exploration team in advancing the Minnesota Nickel Copper Sulfide Project in Greenland. Prior to that, she was a Vice President Exploration for a six-year period with Continental Nickel Limited, where she and her team made new discoveries and defined mineral resources at the Antaka Hill Project in Tanzania. Patty began her career in Sudbury with Falcon Bridge Limited and worked for over 18 years in various roles, including Senior Geologist, International Nickel Sulfide Exploration. Following Patty's presentation, we'll hear from Heather. We'd like to encourage questions. Please write them in the questions section of the navigation panel. I will pose them to Patty and Heather, time permitting, when both women have had a chance to speak. With that, I'll hand things over to Patty. Thank you, Kristen. It's a pleasure to be here today to share my experiences as a woman involved in mineral exploration. I'm just going to uh, wait one second here to make sure we have the slides loaded up. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So um, if I could have the second slide, please. I've often been asked why I became a geologist. And the truth is, I've loved rocks since I was a child. I used to collect stones while on, while on family fishing trips and deposit them in my mother's purse. So when I was older and learned about more, more about university programs in geology, my career choice was set. When I reflect back over the last 30 or so years, two things really stand out as having, having been essential to the progression of my career. These two things are equal opportunity and mutual respect of colleagues. My opportunities came in the form of both new jobs and responsibilities and also in the form of training and mentoring that I received. For context, when I was in university, the male-female ratio in my classes was nine to one. When I entered the workforce, it was similar. So for the most part, the opportunities I was given were created by open-minded men. Earning and receiving and reciprocating the respect of my colleagues allowed me to establish my reputation in the industry. It also made day-to-day -day interactions both pleasant and rewarding. Now I'd like to share some, with you some of the opportunities I've had in my career and the highlights and challenges that have resulted from these opportunities. I'm going to apologize in advance for not having the time to mention all of the wonderful people I've met along my journey. While I was a student at the University of Manitoba, I was fortunate to obtain summer work with the Manitoba Geological Survey, the Geological Survey of Canada, and with SO Minerals. This was an ideal progression as it gave me early mapping experience followed by my first exposure to mineral exploration. To me, uh, mineral exploration was the ideal practical application of geology, and I ended up becoming a nickel sulfide specialist. I had the opportunity to work in three of Canada's major nickel camps, Sudbury, Thompson, Raglan, um, and before moving on to international work. My career began in Sudbury with Falconbridge Limited during what was kind of a, a renaissance time with the exploration group. I was one of a number of young geologists hired to explore the basin and surrounding areas. Initially, I was the only full-time female geologist in the office, but we subsequently hired a number of other female geology students to work on summer field programs. Two names come readily to mind, Catherine Farrow and Lori Cormos, both of whom went on to have their own successful careers in the industry. The company was very supportive in providing training and fostering a work in positive work environment. Some of the people who provided mentoring and strong leadership at the time were Ted Barnett, Carol Gibson, Dave Comba, Paul Severn, and Mike Nucky. Starting my career in an established mining camp with a large company like Falconbridge <clears throat> provided invaluable early training and support. For this reason, I often used to recommend starting with a larger company. 
However, I now feel that many junior exploration companies are also great first employers. Our industry has seen a progression whereby large companies are doing less and less greenfields exploration. In addition, many of the experienced people in the industry through downsizing and attrition have ended up working for junior explorers. So the mentors are there. After a couple of years in Sudbury, I moved back to Manitoba where I started working in the Thompson Nickel Belt. My project was at William Lake in the sub Oak portion of the belt where geophysics and drilling were essential exploration tools. This was a whole different experience compared to Sudbury. The exploration team was much smaller. The winter temperatures were frigid. The field areas were much more remote and I spent lots of time living in tents and trailers. In fact, I was often the only female on site. When I received the news that I was given a Trailblazer Award, um, I had to chuckle because the first image that came to mind was a younger version of myself blazing trails on snowshoes and snowmobiles to drill sites. I did a lot of that. It was tough work and support was usually limited to radio or phone contact with the office in Winnipeg. I had to figure out how to do things on my own and just as importantly, I had to earn the respect of field crews that I lived and worked with. This period of my career was essential in building confidence and earning professional credibility. I think putting your time in and acquiring hands-on experience early in your career is essential in making you a better supervisor and manager later in your career. After a number of years in the Thompson Nickel Belt, I went on to a completely different role. Falconbridge and Naranda had jointly gained proprietary access to the use of a new airborne hyperspectral sensor. Richard Moore, one of the Falconbridge managers, selected me to head up our company's hyperspectral program. My challenge was to become proficient in the use of the technology and to develop ways to use it for nickel sulfide exploration. This was a daunting challenge because I knew little about remote sensing and literally nothing about hyperspectral imaging when I started. My job was also complicated by the fact that nickel sulfide deposits typically lack alteration signatures, which can be readily identified using remote sensing techniques. Mike Peshko, pictured here, was my Naranda counterpart, and he provided a large amount of initial training and support. We flew hyperspectral surveys in the Canadian Arctic, including the Raglan Belt, and at other international locations. Eventually, I was able to develop processing and field follow-up methodologies specific to nickel sulfide exploration. And at Raglan, this contributed directly to the discovery of a small sulfide lens, which was subsequently mined. I also participated in the surveys flown by Naranda for porphyry copper exploration in Chile. One of my more interesting projects was to process hyperspectral data surrounding Falcon Bridge's Koyawasi mine in order to try and identify exotic copper oxide targets similar to the Winkintipa deposit. I generated a number of targets and we went in the field to check them out. This involves going to the exact GPS location correlating with the hyperspectral pick. We were successful in finding new malachite occurrences at several of the targets and I was quite flattered when one of the Chilean geologists called me bruja, which means witch in Spanish. I became part of a larger remote sensing network and this period of my career would not have been possible without their support. This network included several very talented women who I count as both colleagues and friends. They include Judy Wong from Falconbridge, Laurie Wickert, who was working with Alcan at the time, and Zhao Dong Zhu, who was from Barrick. My last position with Falconbridge was as a senior geologist with the International Nickel Sulfide Exploration Group managing projects in Norway. Norway presented new challenges. There were a number of private landowners to deal with, and the local population was very well read and quite interested in our exploration activities. The fellow pictured with me in the right-hand photo is Finn Hansen. Finn had worked with Falcon Bridge's Norwegian exploration arm in the past, and he was instrumental in helping us uh, by making introductions and teaching us the ropes in Norway. We held community information sessions, and our exploration activities were featured in a number of newspaper articles. I became a figurehead of sorts for the project, and I had to get used to being interviewed and seeing myself in print. It was a little disconcerting at first. I'm not sure we always got the messaging perfect, but it was obvious how important community engagement and transparency were to obtaining local support. My career with Falconbridge Limited came to an end with the takeover, the takeover of the company by Extrata in late 2006. However, I did not have much time to think about or mourn my job loss. Within 24 hours of leaving Falconbridge, I was on a plane to Africa to look at a new nickel sulfide project in Tanzania, where an Australian company had recently pulled a good drill intersection, was an, good drill intersection and was contemplating launching a new junior company on the Toronto Venture Stock Exchange. 
This trip proved to be the start of my career with Continental Nickel Limited, which we officially IPO'd in the summer of 2007. Elaine Ellingham, who is the blonde woman you see in a couple of these photos, was instrumental in the spin out of CNI, and she gave me my first experience to junior exploration. Craig McDougall, the fellow on the far left in the upper photo, became the CEO of the new company, and I became the vice president of exploration. As the VPX, it was my primary responsibility to assemble and lead a team to explore the Natchin Way of property in Southeast Tanzania. However, we were a small group. Initially, it was just Craig and myself operating out of a shared office room in downtown Toronto. We had to build the team and the company from the bottom up, and my found, I found myself doing a bit of everything. Challenges included hiring an integrated technical team comprised of both Canadians and Tanzanians, establishing a support office in Dar es Salaam, as well as a field camp at the project site. I had to become familiar with Tanzanian mining regulations, and I also had to establish government and local community contact contacts. I interfaced a lot with the government on land tenure and illegal mining issues, and I became the de facto DAR office manager and sometimes also the HR department. Amina McCallie, standing to my right in the left photo, and Chris Ayera on the far right in the upper row, were both instrumental in helping to recruit additional Tanzanian personnel and also in developing a network of local suppliers. My work in Tanzania was memorable for a number of reasons. Um, the Tanzania project was located in Southeast Tanzania in an area where local communities knew little, if anything, about mineral exploration. This meant that we had a unique opportunity of starting with what was essentially a blank slate. It was up to us to set the standards for working with the local communities, and we had the chance to do it right or the risk of screwing it up. Our Tanzanian team consisted of geologists, technicians, laborers, and support people. We hired many people from Ndidi Village, including a number of women who were hired to help both in the camp and in the processing of our soil samples. We also routinely hired geology students from the University of Dar es Salaam each field season. I was always impressed by how hardworking everyone was and by the unlimited desire to learn new skills. I think one of our proudest accomplishments was building a strong team comprised of individuals from such different cultural and social backgrounds who were able to work together towards a common goal and who were all proud to represent the company. Mutual respect and teamwork were underlying principles and served us well. Community engagement was an integral part of our activities and we conducted a number of site visits to our field camp where we would explain what exploration was all about and also provide updates on the project. Interacting with local communities in a transparent, and respectful way was critical to our efforts and was reflected in the strong level of local support we received. I recall one amusing incident which demonstrated this local support. One day, while we were in the field giving some representatives of a mining company a tour, we stopped to discuss one particular target area which was located within a farmer's field. The farmer was actually present and one of our Tanzanian geologists went over to speak to him. To my dismay, the farmer started talking loudly and rapidly in Swahili and he seemed to be quite agitated. I thought he must be upset with us. It turned out that he simply wanted to know exactly where we wanted to drill so that he could help clear the area of vegetation. A highlight from my time in Tanzania was of course the exploration success we enjoyed. Some of the key members of our original technical team are shown in the photo on the left. So perhaps this is a good time to also comment on how teams are built through networks. Craig and I both worked with the International Nickel Sulfide Group after Naranda and Falkenbridge merged, and it was this relationship that led both of us to get on that plane to Africa together. Sharon Taylor in the inset photo was a geophysicist that I'd worked with at Falkenbridge, and when she left Extrata, I jumped at the chance to ask her to join me uh, as CNI. She and I have worked together for over 20 years. Jerry Kachin, second from the left, was recommended to me by my husband Marius, who had worked with him at Placer Dome's Muscle White Mine. Jerry also worked with Sharon and I more recently at North American Nickel. Godfrey Malia, third from the left, came to us through the Australian company who had originally had the property. Chris Ayero on the far right had also worked with my husband at the North Mara mine in Tanzania and also came highly recommended. Chris in turn brought Stanislaus William on the far left to our team. We were fortunate to obtain good drill intersections right from the start and we went on to complete 243-101 compliant mineral resource estimates on the project. The early drilling success also meant longevity for the project, and we were able to give something back to the local community, as well as provide more technical training for our team. 
We supported various community development initiatives, including the construction of a two-room secondary school in Ndidi Village. and also the construction of the Ndidi Medical Clinic. The photo on the far right is of the Ndidi women performing a celebratory dance at the opening ceremony. One of our more memorable team and training initiatives was a field trip to South Africa and Zambia, where we toured the Nkomati and Manali nickel sulfide mines. After CNI, I joined North American Nickel, whose flagship project was the Manitsoc Project in Southwest Greenland. Our exploration team was quite diverse and was comprised of Canadians, Greenlanders, and Europeans, with women well represented. This project came with the technical challenge of a very old and strongly deformed and metamorphosed geological terrain. It forced me to utilize all of the exploration tools I had acquired over my entire career, and it proved that you never stop learning. While part of the Minitsoc project, I had the opportunity to be involved in two special initiatives. The first was a student practicum program. Each year, the company gave two students from Cardiff University the opportunity to join the Greenland team and learn about exploration, as well as undertake independent mapping projects. The students proved to be very keen, and some of them later returned as summer employees. The second initiative was a large-scale mapping project headed up by Julie Hollis, shown in the upper right photo. The mapping area included our exploration licenses and the company supported the project both in terms of data and logistics. Many good geological discussion, discussions were shared with this talented group of government and academic geologists and this initiative will continue in 2018. In January of this year, I officially retired as VPX of North American Nickel, but I'm pleased to remain on the company's technical advisory board. When I look back at my career, I feel truly privileged to have been given so many opportunities to have traveled the world and met so many wonderful and talented people. I would be remiss not to acknowledge my husband, Marius, who is also a geologist and has been my trusted sounding board over the years. Many times in my career, I was faced with new challenges and was not sure where to begin. It's taken me almost my whole career to recognize that when I simply put my head down, have confidence and dive in, I always get the job done. So if I could offer up one piece of advice to young people beginning their careers, it would be to tell yourself, I can do it, instead of asking, can I do it? Over the course of my career, I've also come to realize the importance of mentoring and networking. When I thought about the people I'd mentored, I realized with some initial surprise that I had probably mentored many more men than women. I guess this should not have been a surprise given the statistics of the industry at the time, but also because I think mentoring is a particular strength that women have. I know all of the women here have, have certainly done their fair share of mentoring. Women are also very good at networking. On the left-hand side of the slide are some of the strong women who've been part of my industry network. These include Sharon Taylor in red, and below her, Judy Wong, both coworkers starting with Falconbridge, Zhao Dongshu and Lori Wickert in the upper photo, along with Judy, who are part of my remote sensing network and Jacqueline Ruptash in the lower left photo, who I work closely with at North American Nickel. In order to continue building a bright future for women in mining, I think we need to continue to utilize our strong mentoring and networking skills to open doors and provide opportunities for others. The young geoscientists graduating today have grown up with the internet and the explosion of social media. As such, they have a unique set of skills which can help to bring people and knowledge together much more quickly and efficiently than in the past. I think an interesting challenge for our industry is how best to harness this energy and experience. I would like to conclude by congratulating my co-winner Heather and by thanking my uh, women in mining again for the great honor of receiving a Trailblazer Award and the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Patty, for uh, sharing your story with us. I will just switch things back. I just realized I just need to pause this uh, PowerPoint so it doesn't keep on trucking along. So great. With that, we'll uh, talk about Heather. So Heather is the Director of Communications and External Relations at or Iron Ore Company Canada. Throughout her career, Heather has been involved in numerous initiatives to strengthen gender equity in the workplace and the province, including co-facilitating the Women in Mining Forum's 
sponsored by the Newfoundland and Labrador Natural Resources, as well as a resource for numerous forums to promote women in mining. She has served as a board member of the Labrador Status of Women, director of the Newfoundland Employers Council, and president, Canadian Institute of Mining, Newfoundland branch. She is also the first female chair of mining industry, Newfoundland. With that, I'll hand things over to Heather. Thank you, Kristen. <clears throat> and I'll just wait until the slides are uh, on the screen, but I guess I can start by saying good afternoon. And I'd certainly like to uh, thank the Women in Mining Canada for the work they do every day, which adds such value in our industry uh, and beyond. I'm honored to have been chosen with Patty as the co-recipient of the 2018 Trailblazer Award, and I'm happy to be sharing with you today the learnings and the fun I've had along the way of my 32 years in the mining industry. For those who may be very young on the phone call today, who have not yet reached 30 years of age and are finding it unbelievable to imagine a career of that duration, it seems to me like I started yesterday. So the old adage, time flies when you are having fun, is very true. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge all the diverse communities in which the company I work for, Rio Tinto, the Iron Ore Company of Canada, work across the globe, and all the people who contribute to and make up our team, as well as our broader team within the mining industry. This photo of leaders is an interesting one, as it is not likely if I asked everyone which of these people is the Newfoundland and Labrador Minister responsible for natural resources mining that you would necessarily pick the woman standing next to me. And yet if I asked many people to pick the Newfoundland and Labrador Minister responsible for the status of women, they'd likely select the woman. In fact, this minister has both portfolios and is a great example of women in mining. At IRC, we always start with an HSE share. So for today, my quick but important share is about women and heart health. Heart disease is actually the leading cause of premature death for women in Canada, with five times as many women dying from heart disease as breast cancer. And women who've heard, had a heart attack are more likely to die or suffer a second heart attack compared to men. And these risks are even higher as we talk about diverse workplaces for indigenous and ethnically diverse women, those living in poverty and women in remote and rural areas. So how do we take control? It's not just control of our careers that we want to talk about today, but taking control of your life. So some of the things you can do is become and remain smoke free, achieve and maintain a healthy body weight, be physically active, maintain a healthy blood pressure, eat a well-balanced diet, and use medications if necessary to reduce, reduce the risk of heart disease. So yes, we are all very busy people, very busy women, and yes, we have lots of competing priorities likely within our home lives and our work lives. But we must take care of ourselves first. If we are never too busy to care for others, then we cannot be too busy to care for our own health. To get started, as leaders, we can always use a little humor, and I'm sure none of you have ever been accused of being bossy. Often with men, it is referred to as assertive, and with women, aggressive. I call it determined. Today, what I would like to do is share the lessons I have learned in my 37 years in the workforce, of which I proudly celebrated my 32nd anniversary in the mining industry with Rio Tinto, the Iron Ore Company of Canada, a couple of weeks ago on the actual day that I received my woman in Mining Trailblazer Award. So I plan to share with you a series of quotes that I have gathered over the years, and which have been posted in my many offices or were taped to a wall or folded in a book I carry around. They are now visible on the bulletin board of my home office. They're really a summary of my learnings and have helped to guide me both as a woman and as a leader throughout the past three decades. I would also ask you to reflect on how sharing and applying the lessons we have learned help us to grow the leader in each of us. Have integrity. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Integrity is a core value of mine and also one of IOC's core values. Integrity means following your moral or ethical convictions. It means having the courage and commitment to do what is right, not what is easiest. 
Having integrity means you're true to yourself and you wouldn't do anything that demeans or dishonors who you are as a person. It's a key characteristic of success and works in conjunction with vision and effective communication. I'll share with you a quick example of when I faced a dilemma regarding a leader's integrity. I was a younger female facing an experienced, more senior, more aggressive male leader. I had discovered that a male employee had done something wrong and needed to be terminated as a result. I went to see his male leader and explained the situation. It was a Wednesday. The leader said, I agree, but we will wait and terminate on Friday as I need a report finished, and if not, it will cost thousands of dollars to the business in terms of delay. Despite what it could have been a very intimidating situation, given I was younger, given I was in at that time a very male-dominated in industry, I explained to him, you cannot discover a wrong and cover it till it's convenient to deal with. He disagreed. We brought the situation to a senior male leader who listened patiently while we explained the situation. The senior leader who had incredible integrity took a small pause and replied, I'm not sure about you, but there's no price tag on my integrity. Integrity is doing the right thing in all circumstances, even if no one is watching you. I was not sure of the outcome and I was a little nervous, but I was sure that integrity had nothing to do with gender at the Iron Ore Company of Canada, and it did not then, nor does it today with Rio Tinto or IOC. Work hard. There are two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take the credit. Try to be in the first group, there's less competition. Ever have the situation where you do all the work and someone else claims the praise? Ever feel that as women, we put pressure on ourselves to work harder to prove our capabilities? This can be frustrating. But at the end of the day, as a colleague once said to me, it doesn't really matter who gets the credit. It's important to help deliver results for the business. So if the results are delivered to the business, isn't that the main thing? I would say yes on a good day when you're feeling mature about it, and no on a bad day when you are frustrated with a person who contributed very little and is taking credit for the success particularly when we can sometimes feel that as women, we don't get the credit or respect we deserve. So my suggestion and my experience has been that those who do the work feel the real reward of accomplishment and continue to grow confidence in their capability, which will shine through over time. Those who spend time trying to take credit often lack confidence and have less Heather, did we uh, lose you on the call there? I don't know. Oh, you're back. All good. Work together. A good organization is like a box of crayons. You need different colors of the spectrum, but all crayons should be welcome in the box. I didn't know what diversity meant when I entered the workforce. However, I knew I was different. At the age of 21, when I joined IOC, I was the only woman on a staff of 35 male instructors. Younger by 10 years, the only one with no experience in mining, and one of a few Anglophones in Cecil, Quebec. And then the concept of diversity became clear to me. And I thought, what an incredible gift to a leader and an organization. The work wasn't always easy and learning to know what I should accept in terms of language and joke took some time to figure out. But IOC had always been strongly committed to respect in the workplace. So I knew as a young woman starting my career, there was a lot of support available to me. I am now fortunate enough to work with Rio Tinto IOC, Rio Tinto, a global company that's committed to creating inclusive workplaces where people feel valued and respected and are able to contribute to their fullest potential. Differences can sometimes lead to misunderstandings, but I've learned that often people have more things in common if we take the time to look. Assume positive intentions. Most people come to work every day to do their best. Look for the best in people and you will find it. If everyone was the same, it would be pretty boring. Diversity exists in your work family, your circle of friends, your own family. Diversity of thought, experience, gender, 
sexual orientation, cultural background, religious beliefs. Diversity is what makes us stronger as women in a business, in our community, in our province, our country, and our mining industry. Celebrate the diversity around you whenever you can. Use influence, not authority. This new kind of business hero must learn to operate without the might of hierarchy behind them. The crutch of authority must be thrown away and replaced by their own ability to make relationships, use influence, and work with others to achieve results. You heard Patty mention the importance of networks. Relationships are a critical part of success as a woman and as a leader. Just as leaders invest in training and technology and upgrading equipment, we must invest in our network on a regular basis. We must always be reciprocal and available when someone needs help or support. Use a chart to regularly review your network. Develop a plan to ensure you have strong contacts in a broad range of areas within business and the broader community. To be successful, you must understand what makes a person tick and adjust your style of communication and your approach accordingly. I feel that this is a skill that often comes more naturally to women. So use your strengths to your advantage to build those strong relationships and networks. One of the most valuable projects I worked on at IOC, of which I was not in charge, but helped to influence, brought the number of women in our workplace from about 5% in non-traditional jobs to 20%. We now have 35% of our female operators in the mine. So what we once called non-traditional, we don't call that anymore. It's pretty traditional at IOC to see a female operator. Circle of influence, a valuable tool I use and which I always have tucked in my book I carry with me is Stephen Covey's tool. A circle of concern encompasses the wide range of concerns we have, such as our health, our children, problems at work, the amount of government boring, or the threat of war. The circle of influence encompasses those concerns that we can do something about. They are concerns over which we have control. Stephen Covey defines proactive as being responsible for our own lives, our behavior is a function of our decisions, not our conditions. Proactive people focus on issues within their circle of influence. They work on things they can do something about. The nature of the energy in doing is positive, enlarging, and magnifying. They increase their circle of influence. Circle of concern takes your positive energy and wastes it in, if only, as a victim. I like a recent quote I saw that said, an effective leader doesn't waste time debating if the glass is half empty or half full. A high functioning leader, male or female, looks to fill the glass quickly. Create your own path. Life isn't about finding yourself, life is about creating yourself. So many of us grow up knowing what we want to be or do in life and many others are still searching for that answer well into their careers. My experience in career path came from finding something I liked and was good at, and then grasping every opportunity that came along. So I liked French in school and decided to do a French degree. Many skeptics said to me, what can you possibly do with a BA in French? I can assure you, a three decade career in mining was certainly not on my mind. During university, I applied for a part-time job teaching French, and a student was an interviewer with IOC and so began my understanding of the value of the network and my lifelong career with IOC. I started training employees at the mine in Labrador City, was then sent to Sitil in the downturn in the 80s as a public relations assistant, chosen in part because I spoke French. I taught the senior managers at that time. They were all male and all as old as my father, which many thought would be intimidating. But hey, I was the teacher and they were the students. So remember, Always be confident in what you do know instead of focusing on what you don't. When layoffs hit again, I went to work at Revenue Canada Taxation Agency, the common thread being bilingual. Next stop was at Manpower. Yes, that's what they called employment and immigration in those days. Back to IOC in 1990 and since then a series of roles including recruiting, organizational effectiveness, design and delivery of leadership training, labor negotiations, media, government and community relations, and the list goes on. The key to such a rewarding path, accept any task, do it well with a smile and learn from it. So what can you do with the BA in French? Have a wonderful career in mining and a wonderful adventurous life. 
Understand what's truly important. Imagine life is a game in which you are juggling five balls. The balls are called work, family, health, friends, and integrity, and you're keeping them all in the air. But one day you finally come to understand that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. The other four balls are made of glass. If you drop one of these, it will be irrevocably scuffed, nicked, or perhaps even shattered. It had always been part of my plan to be a mother and to have lots of quality time with my family as I had experienced growing up. So very early days in discussion with my leader, I always expected that career was very important, but would always come second to family. What's important here is determine how you want to measure success and have those discussions with your leader, your partner, your caregiver. It is not the number of hours punched at home or at work that counts. It's the quality of the results delivered. There will always be trade-offs, tough choices, disappointments, and adversities to overcome. There are the constantly changing needs of family, however you define a family. Whether you choose to have children, need to care for an ailing parent, or even yourself, or count close friends or pets within that tight-knit circle. You need to find creative solutions. For me as a working mom back in the early days, I used a tape recorder to leave stories for my children when I would be away traveling. Now, of course, we have the advantage of FaceTime. I remember one particular trip when I was packing a suitcase for a trip to Australia and my daughter wanted to play. My husband was stressed over what she was gonna to wear to school. I think she was in kindergarten. And I was trying to figure out how to get the suitcase packed, play with my daughter <clears throat> and alleviate my husband's stress. So I had my daughter We uh, might have lost Heather again. She had some technical difficulties uh, at uh, the office. So it uh, sounds like she might be back. Heather? Yes. Perfect. You just cut out what you were talking about your uh, daughter and uh, trying to ma manage all uh, everything going on as you were getting ready for that trip. Okay. So so I'll just, I may be repetitive, but I was, one, I was packing in my suitcase and I had my daughter create colored circles with the days of the week in French, which she then put, put over the hangers of her school clothes. She thought she was playing a game. My husband then knew what she could wear to school, and I got my suitcase packed. Everyone thought they won. It's really when I learned what is multitasking. Balancing home and work is not 50-50. It's knowing when the balancing beam is going to tip, know when it is too narrow, and know when you can take your time crossing it. Reward your support team, your spouse, your children, your friends, and your child caregiver. Reward yourself. As someone once said to me, when I was trying to do it all, working late nights, flying on the early, very early flight in the morning, rushing to the office too late in the day, do you really think on your headstone it will be impressive to see she took the early flight? You need to know what balance is. Enjoy the journey. It isn't just about the destination. It's also about the journey. You must take time to enjoy what you are doing along the way. You must take time to stop and celebrate and to learn from your mistakes. I recently read a quote from Nelson Mandela that I like very much. He said, I never lose, I win, or I learn. So it's okay even to cry now and then, but to pick yourself up and move on. Questions I, can, questions I was asked in my career that I can think of, um, and then answers I gave such as, what does your husband say when you are traveling with men? My husband Jim's answer was, don't forget to get your aeroplane points. How can we allow women to work underground with men? Their wives won't like it. My response, their boyfriends might not either. Who minds your kids when you work and travel? My response, their other parent. And if you stayed home, wouldn't men not be on layoff? My answer, not sure. That's not why I got a good education and wanted a career. These could have all been very depressing, but I used every opportunity as a teachable moment and chose to lighten the conversation versus trying to enter into a battle. Your work family are to be treasured and you must enjoy the hours you spend with them and develop strong supportive relationships within the diverse team. Always take every opportunity to be a coach or a guide and guiding along the path should be part of the fun with all the bumps and twists and turns to get you to the destination. Blazing trails does not mean taking the paved highway. It often means taking the dirt trail. Support and promote others. 
I know this quote, real queens fix each other's crowns, which I got from a colleague within Rio Tinto, sounds like I think a part of the royal family. So maybe given we're talking about mining, I should say, successful miners fix each other's hard hats. A big part of being successful in my view is in being able to stand back and support others, which is something that applies to all of us. It's not grabbing the glory that makes you a success. It's helping to support, coach, and mentor the women and people around you who could learn and benefit from your experience, your wisdom, and your life learnings, no matter your role or title or theirs. Be generous with the gifts and skills that you have. You will grow as a woman and as a person and help those around you to grow also. To continue to grow as a woman and as a leader, value the people around you and seek their input to bring innovative ideas to the table that will make our workplaces and communities and our industry stronger. Be bold, be brave, and take the learnings and examples of others to continue to develop yourself as a person and as a woman. This will lead to your own success, however you choose to measure it. In closing, I thank Women in Mining Canada for this terrific opportunity and encourage you all to define success on your own terms. Use your talents to find work that you love, take risks and seize opportunities that come your way. It's not always easy, but just keep putting one foot in front of the other, one step at a time. As women in mining, no matter our role, we are all blazing trails that others can follow to grow this industry and create truly representative and inclusive workplaces. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Heather, for uh, sharing that with us. I'm just going to switch back to uh, the presentation. And great. Okay. So, uh, so now after we've heard two different stories and two different perspectives, I'd like to start things off with a question. Uh, and again, encourage our uh, listeners, if you want to pose a question to either Patty or Heather, to please uh, indicate so on the in the navigation uh, panel. So starting with you, Heather, how would you describe the change in diversity in mining you have observed over your career? I think that the, definite non the definition of non-traditional is, is changing significantly and becoming more traditional. Um, there are a lot more role models within within mining uh, for women, with female role models, not just male role models. Um, Rio Tinto, for example, at PDAC um, introduced the International Women in Resources Mentorship Program, which is a terrific opportunity um, for others to learn from the experience of women who've gone before them in mining. I think the fact that my 31-year-old daughter doesn't know the workplace as I do, she knows it as much more balanced and much more diverse is a good start. And I hope that when it's time for my granddaughter to perhaps enter into the same industry, that again, the workplace will truly be fully inclusive. Thanks for that, Heather. Patty, how would you uh, describe diversity and the change? Well, I think there's certainly more women engaged in field exploration um, now than there was when I started out. And certainly now it's not uncommon to have female geologists on our field crews. I would say that I've also seen an increasing number of women in more diverse mining related roles, including HR, IR, and even financing. Um, and another uh, thing that I've observed over time is the increase in female entrepreneurship, which is really positive. For example, when Falconbridge Limited closed their Winnipeg exploration office, the two women who made up the drafting department of that office, Giselle, Giselle Schwinn and Yvette Hawks, they uh, quickly launched their own GIS company called Zone 14. This company was quite successful and also went on to provide geological services. Likewise, a talented female geologist I worked with in the past called Shastri Ramnath acquired an MBA partway through her career, and she started a successful geological services company called Oryx. The increasing number of women in mining related roles means we have more women out there to act as mentors. And I've also noted that um, Women in Mining is a forum that helps create diversity, and I can cite one specific example. I've attended the Lon London Mining and Money uh, Conference for the last several years, and I always go to the Women in Mining reception, which is similar to the one they have at PDAC. Last year, I met and chat chatted with two African women at this event who told me that they belong to the Women in Mining group in their own country. So that shows the network is truly growing. Great. Uh, thanks, Patty. Um, there was a question posed, uh, just wondering about a recording. Uh, yes, this uh, webcast has been recorded and will be available following the 
the webcast. Uh, there'll be a link available on the Women Canada website as well as through Ensemble. Uh, uh, Heather, uh, another question for you. Uh, did you ever have a moment of failure or difficulty in your career? How did you overcome it and how did you help or how did it help you move forward? Wondering if we might have lost Heather. Patty, I feel it's a very good question for you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you know, I was always so busy working that I didn't have much time to dwell over things that did not go according to plan. So I guess you could say that keeping busy helps. Um, however, there were a couple of positions that I applied for in my career that I didn't get, and that was a big disappointment to me. So my response was to keep doing the best work that I could and keep trying for new opportunities. And those doors eventually did open. Great, I think that's uh, some good encouragement as we all face difficulties in our careers. Um, if Heather's back on the line. I okay, apologize for the inconvenience. <laughs> no, we, it's uh, completely fine. We'll, we'll work with what we got. Um, he Heather, three words that you can leave with our audience with for their path forward. So what would be the three words you would leave with them? Embrace every opportunity. Patty, same question. Um, three separate words, I think. Networking, mentoring, and confidence. Perfect. Um, I just have uh, one more question. Um, and then we'll wrap things up uh, possibly a little bit earlier. Uh, I'll start off with uh, Heather. What are your thoughts for the young women graduates about considering multidisciplinary in preparation for career in mining? I think that a wide variety of experience is actually extremely valuable. So no matter what roles you have leading into your career and no matter what paths you take within your career, there's always opportunities to learn. I think important skills like interpersonal skills, communication skills, project management skills, are equally as important as technical skills. So again, when I say embrace every opportunity, I think that don't be disappointed if the first job you get is not the one you were looking for. Take full advantage, whatever it can offer you. And in each and every interaction you have on the job, off the job, in a volunteer role or in a paid role, take full advantage to learn and to share with others. And that will help you be very successful in your career. Thanks, Heather. Patty, anything to add? Um, I guess, uh, you know, as an exploration geologist, I feel strongly there's no better training at the start of your career than actually being out in the field and learning the ropes. There's just so much that you learn on the job that you can't learn at university. And I also feel that getting those first summer jobs in the industry is, is a huge help to your career. Um, like Heather, diversity uh, in a skill set is also good in acquiring specialties, for exploration at least, acquiring specialties like structural geology and 3D modeling. It really makes you stand out as, um, as a strong candidate uh, on an application form. Great. Well, thank you both, Patty and Heather. Uh, before we end the webcast, Wim Canada would like to mention some upcoming webcasts. Um, I have them here on the screen. Uh, May 1st, Wim Canada's 2018 Aboriginal Trailblazer, Nalene Morin, and Aboriginal Student Trailblazer, Rochelle Ambrus, or I'm sorry, Rachel Ambrus, will discuss culture and mining. This discussion will be moderated by Lana Eagle. Also, a later date in May, still to be determined, we'll talk about mentorship, informal and formal relationships, which has been a big discussion point for increasing diversity. So keep a lookout. We'll start advertising soon. So for more information on WIM Canada, please visit us online or follow us on social media. If you enjoyed today's discussion, please invite your colleagues and contacts to join the Ensemble Network. Ensemble is a is free to join diversity and inclusion network where members receive alerts for future web webinars as well as updates on exciting industry events. Again, this webcast will be available online for those unable to tune in. Thank you to everyone for participating in the webcast and congratulations again to our trailblazers, Patricia Trishman and Heather Brucevich on uh, receiving these uh, awards.
Excellent. And thank you so much, Kristen, for moderating. We are very happy to have all of you included on this excellent presentation. Uh, thank you to Heather and Patty for your very inspirational presentation, and on top of that, your contributions to our industry over your wonderful careers. We have actually had a couple of questions come in since uh, the end of our webcast, so if you guys have a few more minutes to address these questions from our audience members, we'd love to uh, get these out to you. So are you still with us, Patty and Heather? Sure. Sure. Excellent. So I have a question specifically for Patty right now. Uh, could you share the most challenging work experience you've had and how you dealt with it? Yeah, there's been a lot of challenges in my career. I guess I still would go back to that time period when I worked in the Thompson Nickel Belt that I talked about in, in my presentation. Um, you know, being the only woman on site in field camps was a challenge in itself. And also being um, sort of the often the only geologist on site as well. Uh, which meant that really you had to figure things out for yourself. So the support was far away. It was completely different than in Sudbury uh, where it started. And, you know, again, really what you had to do was just, um, you know, use your skill set that you had, put your head down, uh, try things, see what worked and get the job done. Great. Thank you. Uh, this next question we have is for both Patty and Heather. Uh, are there any specific differences that you've noticed or challenges uh, for women in mining between junior and major mining companies? Or is there anything you care to comment on there? Heather, did you want to go first? Um, well, again, I've, I've really only worked at, um, you know, in, in, within mining itself, it's mostly, mostly been with, with the Iron Ore Company of Canada. What I would say is that there are likely, um, you know, less opportunities in the junior companies, but on the other hand, you can become very much of a generalist, and so it gives you an opportunity oftentimes to do many tasks that you wouldn't get to do if you were in a larger uh, mining organization. So I think there are advantages and, and disadvantages to both, and again, I think you just take full, uh, full advantage of whatever uh, one you find yourself in. Yeah, I would certainly uh, agree with Heather there, and, and there probably is more um, variety in working for a junior company. Um, as I mentioned again in the presentation, there's a bigger safe, there's a bigger support network in larger companies, but that really has has changed over time, at least for exploration geologists. And um, you know, now with so many people um, who started with big companies now working for junior companies. I think what's really important if you're out there looking for a job and you're considering a junior exploration uh, or mining company is that you take a good hard look at the people behind that company. And you'll see there's often a wealth of experience. And if you select carefully, um, then I think that that can be a great place to start your career as well. All right, well, thank you both. We really appreciate both the questions from our audience and those excellent responses from both of you. So thank you again for taking the time to stick with us here. I believe that is uh, all the questions that we have for today. Uh, if anyone else has any further questions that were not addressed in this webcast, we encourage you to stay connected using our Ensemble network. As mentioned, uh, through Kristen, a recording of today's webinar will be available on both the Ensemble site and on YouTube, and we encourage you to review our monthly blog post when it's been posted. This concludes our ensemble webcast for today, and uh, we ask you that you enjoy the rest of your Tuesdays and tune in next month. Thank you very much, and goodbye.